From the moment Toonami was launched in the late 90s, it was only a matter of time before anime went from being niche in the West to completely mainstream. Everyone loves it now. But as a black fan, I think it's been especially interesting to see the many ways anime has been embraced by black culture over the years. We reference it in our music. Our celebrities can't get enough of it. Does Samuel L. Jackson like anime? Yes, I do. Hentai too. <laughs> and half of us that like anime have at least one Akatsuki cloud print do-rag or bonnet somewhere around our homes. Please move on from them. I think something that a lot of non-Japanese anime fans all over the world can appreciate is their cultures or ethnicities being positively represented by characters in the shows they're watching. With anime primarily being made for Japanese audiences, and Japan itself mostly being ethnically homogenous, representation in anime isn't really something that the average international viewer should expect. It's just sick when it happens. I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't get hype whenever I see a cool character that looks like me in an anime I like. However. I haven't always felt this way because a lot of black anime characters used to look like this. Chocolate. And now I have a big question for all of you. Is this design racist? Well, it's not that simple of a question to answer because while I highly doubt that most artists ever had any intention to offend black people with some of their old character designs, the truth is this imagery, this way of drawing black characters is something that was actually inspired by blackface. And before I even explain, I know some of you are already writing your comments about how I'm just complaining and this isn't a big deal. That's not what this video is. I'm just connecting the dots for everyone and telling what I think is a really interesting story. Okay, let's get into it. I guess we should start by answering the question, what is blackface? Blackface is the practice of wearing makeup to imitate the appearance of a black person. While the origin of its usage may not be clear, it can be traced all the way back to theater productions in the 1600s. Its use to portray characters like Othello at the time did not involve the appropriation and objectification of black appearances and culture that we associate with blackface today. Simply put, it wasn't meant to just be racist. This more modern version of it was popularized in the 19th century, around the year 1830, through the boom of minstrel shows, which are also called minstrelsy. Minstrel shows featured performers who painted their faces black using things like shoe polish, burnt cork, or grease makeup while leaving a ring around their mouths uncovered, so to the audience, it would look like they had big red lips. After dressing themselves in ragged clothing, minstrel performers would sing their versions of black songs, dance their versions of black dances, act out skits, and generally just make an ass out of themselves while displaying some truly harmful stereotypes. What was meant to just be entertainment for primarily white audiences was also highly insulting to people of African descent. And this may come as a surprise to a lot of you, but minstrel shows were actually the very first form of theater that was created exclusively by Americans. These performances began small time. In the early years, shows were mostly done in taverns in the Northeast in front of lower class audiences. But as they gained more and more popularity, they spread to venues as major as opera houses. Minstrelsy and the act of mocking black people eventually became one of the biggest forms of entertainment in the United States. Eventually, it went global, and for a lot of viewers, this extremely distorted portrayal of African American culture was their introduction to it. Because of the American people's fascination with minstrelsy, blackface iconography spread like wildfire to just about every part of US culture you can think of. In the early days of cinema, famous actors regularly wore blackface to play black roles. The depiction of characters with black skin and round, big, bright red lips made its way to products like games, salt and pepper shakers, cookie jars, grocery lists, postcards, lighters, jewelry, and a whole lot more. Blackface inspired characters were made for food branding and other types of advertisements. This is a cartoon that Dr. Seuss himself made for a bug spray ad back in the 1920s. If you look closely, you'll notice that bugs are the least prominent part of this ad. If you've ever wondered why in Green Eggs and Ham this man ran across the planet to get away from Sam I Am, it's because he was just a grumpy old guy that still believed in segregation and that food was just a little too colorful for him. Blackface appeared in children's stories about black characters, it was part of the design of popular toys, and the motif even made its way to comic books. You know Shazam? He's got that one movie you kind of remember seeing back in 2019, and another that came out in 2023 that you definitely didn't see. Well in the 40s, back when he was still known as Captain Marvel, he had a sidekick named Steamboat for a little while that looked like this. The birth of the American animation industry was heavily influenced by blackface minstrelsy. Some historians would say that even the designs of characters like Disney's Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and Mickey Mouse having black bodies, big white eyes, and white mouths prove this. 
Personally, I don't know how much validity there is in that because coloring and design for black and white characters is something that you have to take into consideration. But I also wouldn't be surprised either way. But let's just pretend I didn't even mention that last thing about their designs. Mickey and his friends literally performed a minstrel show and wore blackface to do it. Famous characters wearing blackface was a thing that just used to happen casually, and if a new black character needed to be made, then a lot of the time they were drawn in a way that evoked blackface imagery and played on racist stereotypes. There are about 11 whole Looney Tunes episodes that have basically been banned due to how offensive their portrayals of people of different ethnicities were. By the 1950s, with the rise of the civil rights movement, blackface had largely become seen as insulting and offensive to black people. Because of this, its common usage was slowly phased out in the US. And by now, you're probably wondering, how did this design even reach Japan? While minstrel shows were reaching their peak in popularity in the West, Japan was just being introduced to America and the concept of blackface. During most of the Edo period, Japan had an isolationist foreign policy named Sokoku, or a locked country. Under Sokoku, for well over 200 years, trade to other nations was limited, most foreign nationals were banned from entering the country, and common Japanese citizens were unable to leave. In 1853, an American naval officer named Commodore Matthew Perry led the Perry Expedition, which was made for the purpose of convincing Japan to end their Sokoku and open their ports for trade. In classic US fashion, Perry and his fleet of ships threatened Japan, a country with no navy at the time, with a whole lot of guns and explosives. I imagine it went something like this. What is the purpose of the visit? Jesus Christ. I said Jesus Christ. Right now. And it worked. The next year, in 1854, right. Japan opened themselves up for trade. And whenever two countries form a relationship like this, they begin to share their cultures with each other as well. One of the parts of American culture that Perry introduced to the Japanese people was minstrelsy, because it was arguably the biggest thing in US pop culture at the time. During a banquet that was held to celebrate their newly formed treaty, some of Perry's crewmates darkened their faces using burnt cork, leaving that signature ring around their mouths, and performed a minstrel show with song and dance. Apparently, their guests loved it. And just like how minstrelsy was an introduction to African American culture for a lot of non-black people in the US, it was the same way for the Japanese. And by the way, this was not the first time that Japanese people came into contact with or saw a depiction of a black person. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the story of Yasuke, who was a man of African descent that traveled to Japan and became a samurai. No, this wasn't made up for the anime, it actually did happen, but there just weren't any mechs or anything else crazy like that. Anyway, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, before Japan became an imperialist nation, much like the US at the time, they were receiving all kinds of American exports, including print media like newspapers, magazines, and books that painted the different shades of the American people in the exact biased way you would have expected them to back then. If you weren't European American, you were being described and portrayed as basically being less than human. Japanese artists who had an interest in drawing and painting Americans but had no way to actually see them in person, drew and painted them using the print media they had been receiving from the US as a reference. Because this was all they had to go off of, European Americans would be drawn as posh people doing civilized things. Native Americans would be drawn as violent people with bright red skin, and African Americans would be drawn like this because this is what they were being shown and told African American people were like. This is a 17th century example of how African people were painted in Japan before minstrelsy became popular. You'll notice that there is an obvious lack of gray or black skin and big red lips. That's because modern blackface did not exist at the time. The very concepts of race and racism as a whole were fairly new and had to be taught to people. And let's just say that certain western countries were doing a pretty good job at it. These ideas and images flooded Japan and made their way into its culture through, again, print media and other goods from the West, but also eventually in the early 20th century through American animation as well, which became one of the US's biggest exports to the country. American cartoons were a lot cheaper and further advanced than Japanese animation back then, so they became super popular among Japanese viewers. And remember, this was Mickey Mouse back then. In 1953, a children's book called The Story of Little Black Sambo, which was originally published in the United Kingdom in 1899, was re-released in Japan as Chibikuro Sanpo. The story revolves around a little boy named Sambo who outsmarts four tigers that want to eat him. He does this by offering them his new clothes instead. After accepting, the tigers argue over which one of them looks the best, and eventually, they chase each other so fast that they turn into a big pile of butter that Sambo's mom makes pancakes out of. This book became highly controversial in the West because the characters' names are racial slurs, and they're designed in a way that is pretty offensive. 
Japan largely lacked this racist context back then. They just saw the story as highly imaginative and cute, which it honestly is without all the racism. Conveniently, during this same time, Japan was in the middle of rebranding itself from being one of the Axis powers allied with Nazi Germany and the Kingdom of Italy to being the Kauai capital of the world. Everybody, meet Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty, The story of Little Black Sambo became a bestseller that was beloved in Japan. I think you can make the argument that this is one of the things that opened the door for blackface iconography, which had become taboo in the United States, to have a new home in Japan. A few years after Little Sambo's Japanese release, a strange toy hit the shelves that stole the hearts of Japanese consumers. This is Dako-chan. It's a jet black, plastic inflatable doll with red donut lips, a grass skirt, a holographic eye that winks at you, and two arms perfect for hugging. Initially created as a toy meant for toddlers, Dako-chan became one of the hottest accessories for almost anyone. According to a 1960 Time Magazine article, Dako-chan sold over 300,000 units within two months. People lined up by the thousands to get their own, and production couldn't keep up with the demand. Scalpers resold them to make a profit, and knockoff versions were made too. The article goes on to say that you could see these dolls hanging off the arms of teenagers, the handbags of young women, the broom handles of housewives, and even on the bodies of strippers. This phenomenon became known as the Dako-chan boom of 1960 because well over 2.4 million of them were sold. It even got shipped to the West under the name Winky Dolls and continued to make the Takara Toy Company so much money that they were able to become a corporation that, naturally, would use Dako-chan as their official mascot. They eventually went on to make other notable toys like Beyblades, but during the years before this, a family of three formed a group to protest the usage of blackface imagery that had been so widely accepted in Japanese society since the 1920s. In July of 1988, the Washington Post published a report documenting how racist stereotypes and caricatures that had died off in the US were still alive and well in Japan. The primary subject of the criticism in the article is the entertainment company Sanrio, who are known for Hello Kitty. Two years before this, Sanrio debuted two new characters, Little Sambo and his sister Hannah, whose designs were inspired by outdated 19th century stereotypes for African Americans. The minstrel character Sambo was depicted as being happy-go-lucky, lazy, and carefree. Because of the book Chibikuro Sambo, he just became known as a cute little character in Japan almost an entire century later. Sambo and Hannah were a hit in the East, so Sanrio started producing a whole lot of other merchandise featuring them like beachwear, snacks, and toys that sold fast. Hello Kitty is one of the highest grossing media franchises of all time, so let's just say their international fan base is pretty big. And much like you would expect in the late 80s, these characters were met with some serious outrage when they made their way to Western audiences. Fans wrote letters to Sanrio expressing their anger and disappointment over these designs. But before seeing the criticism of the characters, Sanrio made a statement saying nobody in Japan thought of them as racist. They said they were unaware of the history, and that Sambo and Hannah should just be seen as humorous and funny. Fortunately, Sanrio was eventually receptive to the criticism. They discontinued the usage of all of their characters that were seen as racially insensitive. They apologized and then went on to do a whole bunch more to help combat cultural ignorance. At the same time this was happening, a family consisting of a married couple, Toshiji and Kimiko Arita, along with their son Hajima, read the Washington Post's report about Sanrio and felt inspired to make a change themselves. Literally the month after they read the article, the three of them founded the Association to Stop Racism Against Black People. That was actually the name they came up with, and they ended up doing some good work. Most of their activities included searching for and purchasing hundreds of products with blackface imagery for research purposes and to spread awareness. They also launched protests and sent letters to the corporations of different industries that might have been capitalizing off of offensive iconography. It's not an overstatement to say they made waves. One of their earliest protests ended with the publication of Chibikuro Sambo being discontinued in Japan for a while. Another protest made Takara stop using Dako-chan as their mascot, and they even began making their Winky dolls in other colors that weren't offensive. And another made a drink company named Kalpis stop using their blackface-inspired logo they had been known for since 1923. It wasn't long before the association set their sights on the manga and anime industries as well. The work of the legendary Osamu Tezuka was among the first to receive scrutiny. He is arguably the most influential mangaka of all time, and has the nickname the godfather of anime for a reason. It's because of him that anime became known for its characters having big eyes. He was born in 1928 and grew up watching western cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Betty Boop, Bambi, and other Disney films. These big eyes are obviously something he learned from them before he made the feature his own thing. 
how to draw black characters is another thing that he learned from those cartoons because if you remember around the time he was growing up Mickey Mouse was still doing this and cartoon depictions of black people had black face minstrel inspired designs. His series Kimba the White Lion probably has the most egregious portrayals. What? He said, what would you like to eat, boss? Because of the association's protests, in 1989, the 300 complete edition of Tezuka's work was suspended. The publisher was receptive to criticism, and when they resumed publication, every single edition had a disclaimer stating that the editorial staff took the protests seriously. They went on to say that censoring what they called period-appropriate works would only lead to continued ignorance, which they believed would not be beneficial for any future discourse. The association supposedly went on to launch protests against the work of several other artists, most notably Akira Toriyama, the creator of the most iconic anime series of all time. I know you all have been waiting for this one, but it's finally time we ask ourselves, is Mr. Popo a racist character? No, how could he be a racist? His best friends are green. His design, on the other hand, and the fact that he's a servant, are definitely not a good look, but it's probably not intentionally offensive. And I only say probably because while I am a big fan of Akira Toriyama, so much so that I tried to become a Super Saiyan at least four times as a kid, I don't know that guy. He can be whatever he wants to be. I think the most frequent argument I've seen over the years from people who say Mr. Popo was not inspired by blackface was the fact that he wasn't supposed to actually be a black character. He's a genie. Duh. Let's just pretend for a moment that Mr. Popo wasn't so obviously based on the same exact Sambo design that got Takara and Sanrio in trouble before. Here are what the actual black characters in Akira Toriyama's work looked like in the 80s and early 90s. It wasn't just a Dragon Ball problem either. The black characters in his series Dr. Slump share the same defining feature, those big ass red donut lips. I haven't watched or read Dr. Slump, but I do know that for much of the Dragon Ball series, most of the characters of different ethnicities are all caricatures based on stereotypes, which are all about simplification. A stereotype can be defined as an oversimplified, generalized belief about a group of people that is based off limited knowledge or personal experience. The most recent data I could find about diversity in Japan reported that around 98% of Japanese citizens were ethnically Japanese. Back in the 90s and the decades prior, in which most of these ridiculously designed characters were created, there just wouldn't have been a whole lot of easily accessible references available to help artists accurately depict specific groups of foreign peoples. I'm not trying to make excuses, and I definitely don't think there are any for cases that happened after the creation of the internet, but being realistic, you have to know better in order to do better. According to companies like Sanrio, blackface imagery was just seen as humorous and cute in Japan at the time, and this makes a lot of sense because the minstrel shows that introduced Japan to blackface in the first place were supposed to be fun entertainment. For the most part, the people these shows were meant to make a mockery of weren't in the country saying, hey, this is hurtful, maybe don't do it. It took a Japanese family randomly reading an American news article and saying enough is enough for a lot of changes regarding the usage of offensive imagery to be made in their country. Over the years, the donut lip design has become its own thing. They aren't just a feature that are given exclusively to black characters anymore. Anyone can have them, and I've read comments that said they're supposed to be funny. I'm just not a big fan of the design in general, but that doesn't really matter. I want to end things off by asking you what do you all think about the design itself or any of the information that you learned in the video. Maybe you feel like telling me that all of this was nonsense. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I plan on responding to as many as possible. I personally think it's obvious that the character designs of black and brown characters in anime have gotten insanely better over the years. I never really expect to see too many characters that look like me in anime because, again, Japan is full of mostly Japanese people and anime is primarily made for them. But when I do see a black character, I want to see them be designed at least as well as everyone else. Things like the shape of their mouth or the texture of their hair are really important, and I'm glad it seems like a lot of artists are now taking the time to do things right. I also think it's really cool that some older characters have been given updated designs that don't have troubling ties to 19th century stereotypes. I'm looking at you, Choco Love. If you want to see any of the sources that I used for this video, they are going to be in the description. And while you're there, you might as well go ahead and follow my socials and consider subscribing to my Patreon if you feel like supporting a little bit more so I can keep making videos like this one. Also, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you for watching. Peace.